everyone, welcome back to the Brambleberry channel. I'm London and today I'm going to be talking about how to create a testing strategy for candle making at home. I'm a professional candle maker and I've been making candles in my own business particle goods for the past three years. Over the last year, I helped Brambleberry test every single amazing fragrance that they offer and now you can find all of our fragrance performance notes right there on the product page, just like you would if you were looking for soap making notes. We hope that this will help you make all the decisions that you need to in terms of deciding whether a fragrance will work or whether you wanna test it out in your own candles. A basic testing strategy can be a little bit of work up front to set up, but it's gonna save you so much time and so many headaches in the long run. It's crucial to test all of your components to make sure that they work together before you move on to other variables and fluctuating ingredients such as new containers, fragrances, additives, or dyes. So let's talk a little bit about what that Brambleberry strategy looked like in terms of what we used and why that might be helpful for you when you're setting up your strategy at home. So we used a new wax blend that Brambleberry offers. It's a combination of soy wax and also coconut wax. It comes in this nice little bag. If you're a soaper, you've already probably used these and they're awesome. We also put all of our tests in the same container and we'll talk a little bit about why that's important here in a minute, but these are the four ounce lidded glass jars. So nice shape and size, not too big for testing. So we use two different wicks and we'll talk a little bit more about why you might want to test more than one wick size and more than one wick brand, okay? In our Brambleberry test, we also used uh, fragrance oil at the same usage rate. So all of our fragrances were tested at 6%. Remember, most wax will hold somewhere between six to 10%, maybe 12, depending on the wax blend, but it's always good to start with the lowest usage rate that you can. Testing all of your components together, but specifically your fragrance will help you determine the strength of your hot throw and you'll see all of our hot throw ratings on the website as well, right in that product listing page. Keep in mind that scent is, you know, personal to everyone. So you may smell something that you use and disagree with how I or someone else here at Brambleberry rated it, and we're totally fine with that. We know that scent is its own unique personal experience. But we just wanted to give you a sense of where to start. Is this a strong, medium, or light hot throw fragrance? And that way you can know what you're working with from the start. So after all of that testing, I thought it might be helpful to share with you guys how to create your own testing strategy at home. There are various different kinds of tests that you can do depending on what you wanna solve for. So think of it as kind of an equation with different variables. One might be wax, the other might be fragrance, and the other might be wicks, or some combination of those things, plus or minus a few other things you could throw in there. So let's talk about how to create your own strategy at home. So the first test that I recommend doing is just a really simple baseline test. So we're gonna be looking at our wax blend, our container, and our wicks. This is just to test our core materials and make sure that those are really solid together before we add a variable that might fluctuate. So candle dye or fragrance, et cetera. The first thing you'll wanna do is choose your wax blend. If you're undecided on what wax or wax blend you might wanna use, that's okay. Pick one for now, and then we'll repeat these tests for each and every wax that you wanna test with. After that, you can move on to choosing your container. I recommend testing with a consistent container across the board. In my own line, I use several different containers, but for testing purposes, you wanna isolate one, choose that container and stick with it. The reason being is that there are more variables with more container sizes. So the diameter of these two containers is not the same. Each wick size is going to be determined by the wax type and the diameter of your container. So you could see how that could get really overwhelming and really confusing very quickly. So let's make it as simple as possible. We're gonna put this tin away and we're just gonna pick one container, one type of wax, and then in the next step, we'll talk about how to choose your wicks. Keep in mind if you wanna use a lot of original or one of a kind containers, that's gonna make your quality control process really difficult. It's gonna be hard to tell without testing each and every single one, whether or not it's burning properly and safely.
The next variable that we need to solve for is the wick. Now, when you're doing your initial testing, you might have an idea of a wick brand or type that you wanna use, such as a wooden wick versus a cotton wick, but it's a good idea to test multiple brands and multiple sizes at one time. The best way to do this and make sure that you're getting within the range of what you should be using is to look at the manufacturer's recommendations. Any supplier should have a wick sizing chart right there on their website. So you're gonna look for the diameter of your container and then it should tell you based on your container diameter and your wax type, what wick sizes might work. Usually I recommend testing one to three different wick sizes within each brand. However many brands you wanna try, it's totally up to you. You can mix your wooden wicks and your cotton wicks in the same test and that's perfectly okay. So for this test, this first test, I also recommend not adding fragrance. This is completely personal preference, so if you wanna do that, you can. The reason that I don't add fragrance is because A, it's the most expensive ingredient usually in your candle, but it's also just another variable to worry about. So this is gonna help us narrow down on what wick size and what brands of wicks might be worth testing with our fragrance first. So I also only recommend filling the candle halfway with wax. As you can see, these containers are tapered, so it's gonna take more heat at the wider point of the container than it will at the top. The reason you wanna test this is you wanna make sure that you're gonna reach a full melt pool at the top of the container and as it burns halfway and below, but you also wanna make sure that as it's getting more heat and insulation reflected back into the melt pool halfway down, that it's not gonna become a raging inferno. Can you tell that I speak from personal experience on this? Now we have three different wicks in our same container. And the next thing we're gonna do is exactly that. Fill it halfway full of wax. Make sure if you can, that you pour from the same batch of wax. Once again, we're just talking about eliminating as many variables as we can. So especially if you're using a blend, this will ensure that everything was exactly the same across all three of these tests. Okay guys. Real talk. I'm gonna go against everything I've ever told you. Are you ready? This Brambleberry wax comes in this really cool microwavable bag. And I just feel like even though I've told you don't microwave your wax, I think you should do it a little bit. Okay? So just put this in the microwave for small little bursts, maybe 20 to 30 seconds at a time. And I would just do it until it's soft enough that you can squeeze it right out of the bag and into your pouring pitcher, which can then go into your double boiler. So once again, I know I said not to do it, but like, it's so easy, okay? Trust me, short bursts, you're gonna be just fine. If you're kind of a rule stickler, which I usually am, and you don't wanna do that, that's also okay. Two other options of how you can use this wax in this packaging. One, you can put this into a double boiler being very careful that it's not gonna touch the heat surface below. So like you don't wanna put it on the burner or anything like that. You wanna make sure that it's elevated in that upper chamber. Or you can cut the top off and you can take the wax out and then put that into your uh, pouring pitcher or your double boiler, just like you normally would. All right, so a couple different options for you, one for the rebels, one for the rule followers, one for your kind of you in between. So just like you would in our soy basics video, you've heated up your wax and you didn't need to add any fragrance. So now we're just gonna fill those containers half full. And as you can see, I'm eyeballing it. So half full is, you know, subjective. All right, so once you've poured it, you wanna just make sure that your wick is centered. So you can use, you know, wick centering device, uh, pencil, clothespin, anything like that. And then you wanna set them aside and let them cool. I like to wait about 24 hours before I do the test burn. And that's just because the wax is gonna to continue to shrink a little bit past the visual cooling point. So 24 hours is a good time frame. You could do, you know, more if you like, but that should be sufficient. Okay, let's talk a little bit about what that burn test is actually gonna look like. So when you're ready to burn those candles, I recommend doing them in the same place, but spaced at least three inches apart on a nice level and heat resistant surface. You wanna burn those for, you know, 
two to four hours. Four hours is a great burn time. That's usually the recommended burn time of any candle. However, the actual burn time of your candle to reach a full melt pool, so something like this where it's melted edge to edge and is about one quarter of an inch deep, depends on the diameter of your container. We like to estimate one hour per inch in diameter. So if your diameter is two inches, it should take two hours. It shouldn't take more than four hours, but it might take up to four hours for that first burn. In a container that's tapered like this, it's gonna be a different burn time on the first couple of burns than it might down at the bottom. Again, thinking about that extra insulation that glass and metal are gonna add, um, you're gonna see a faster burn time as you go down. This is why it's so important to make sure you're testing your candle all the way down and starting at that halfway point can be a really good way to measure what that's going to look like. So the visual cues you can look for um, in determining whether or not your wick is properly sized. Number one, is it sooting? You shouldn't see sooting around the top edges, that kind of like very fine black looking dust if your wick is properly sized and or if you are properly trimming your wick. Sooting can also occur if you're not trimming your wick. The next thing you can do is look at the flame. Is the flame really big? Has it got a lot of movement? Or does it seem pretty steady? It's kind of holding its own. It's not waving back and forth. That's also a really good visual cue of how your candle is doing. The condition of your wick will also tell you if your wick is properly sized. The one thing that I always look for is carbon buildup. And that's gonna create this kind of like mushrooming phenomenon that we often see at the very tip of the wick. That's gonna look like these little toadstool heads or small bar balls of carbon buildup right at the end of the wick. And that means that your wick is too large. One of the dangers of having a wick that's too large is that not only is it gonna over consume your candle, but as it burns down to the bottom, it can overheat the glass and cause that glass to crack or worse, explode. Nobody wants an exploding candle. So we wanna make sure that our wick is not too big. You also wanna make sure that your wick is not too small. You'll notice some tunneling or perhaps your you know, flame on your wick is struggling to stay you know, going, it's about to put itself out. Those are signs that your wick might be too small. Tunneling is the most obvious, but you can also tell if that wick is really struggling to stay lit. If you're using soy wax, something you might notice on the surface of the you know, re-solidified melt pool is this kind of like cauliflower top, as we like to call it. It's a really bumpy, uneven surface. That's perfectly normal. It happens with natural wax, specifically with soy wax. So it's not something that you need to worry about. It's not a variable you need to solve for, and it has nothing to do with whether your wick is properly sized. So just wanted to note that in case you see it and are wondering if you did something wrong. The candles that reach a full melt pool during this first burn are gonna give you a really good idea of what sizes and brands of wicks you should try in your next test. Now, a full melt pool means that it's burned or melted edge to edge and is about one quarter of an inch deep. If the wick is too big, then you're gonna see a lot of movement in the flame and it may have reached that full melt pool way too quickly. If the wick is too small, you're gonna see a smaller flame that might be struggling, and you're gonna see some tunneling, like in this candle here, where it definitely hasn't reached a full melt pool, and it looks like it's just gonna to continue to burn straight down the center. The other thing that you wanna look for is a little bit of discoloration. If your candle is properly sized and the wick isn't too big, then you shouldn't see any major discoloration in the melt pool once it's cooled and re-solidified. If you're seeing a lot of dark discoloration, and by dark I mean not off-white, but like orangish yellow or light tan, that's often a sign that your melt pool is overheating because your wick is too large. You'll most likely notice this if you're using fragrances that have a lot of vanilla or vanillin as we call it, because that's gonna be a heavier fragrance oil that's more likely to discolor anyway. So you might find that there's more than one wick size in the same brand that creates that full melt pool, and that's great. You're going to want to bring those two sizes into your next test. The next test we're gonna do is replicating this same test, but with fragrances using the finalists from this round. I recommend using the same fragrance across all of your tests. Why? 
as we talked about earlier, we wanna keep those variables as low as we can. So using one fragrance will help make sure that you're not getting a different result because you used a different fragrance. You're getting a different result because of the wick. You always wanna test your fragrance at the lower end of your usage rate. So as I mentioned earlier in our Brambleberry tests, we did all of our fragrances and essential oils at 6%. Now, personally, my own experience and opinion is that any fragrance that's worth its salt should be able to produce really good hot throw anywhere from six to 8%. You shouldn't have to max out that usage rate. If you're using fragrance oil and you're not getting a very strong hot throw, I would look at the wick size before I would increase your fragrance oil percentage to the very top of that usage rate. Some fragrances are lighter in density while others are heavier in density. This is gonna impact the wick size that may work best with those fragrance oils. If you're using a fragrance oil with a really high flash point and it has a lot of vanillin or vanilla in it, you're probably gonna to need to wick up a little bit. Those tend to be harder for the wick to draw up, so you need a little more heat and you need a larger size. On the other hand, if you're using a lighter, more delicate, or more volatile fragrance oil, you're probably gonna need to wick down. It's not uncommon at all to have one or two wick sizes from each brand that might work well with each fragrance. In my own line, I have two different wick sizes that I know work, one with some fragrance oils, and then one step down that works better with some of our other fragrance oils. Some fragrance oils simply won't perform in candles or are not compatible. In our testing, we found that some of these oils like citrus or herbal oils, oftentimes they were natural or essential oils, produced kind of an off-putting like diesel or camphor smell. And that was just something that we didn't wanna have in our candle. On the other side, there are some candle ingredients, especially in natural and essential oils that you wanna be really careful and do your research on. Essential oils containing things like mint, menthol, camphor can actually be toxic to some small animals and can be really irritating to people with asthma. Anytime you're making candles, make sure that the ingredients that you're using have been tested for candle use and formulated for candle use when possible. Sometimes small amounts of these ingredients blended with others can be perfectly fine. In fact, some of the ingredients that I've tested, such as maybe frankincense or other citrus oils that did not work in a singular use capacity have worked in other blends that I personally have used in candle making. So always good to do your own research and make sure that you're testing things appropriately. If you see something that says not compatible on the Brambleberry website and it's an essential oil, it just means that we tested that essential oil all by itself at a 6% usage rate. And it might actually still work for you if you use it at a different usage rate and blended with other things. So let's talk a little bit about discoloration. If you're a soaper, you already know about discoloration. It's a common phenomenon and it's something that you look out for. If you're new to candle making or you haven't used a lot of fragrance oils and you're not using dye, this is something that you'll wanna keep an eye out. Most likely, if that fragrance oil discolors soap, it's also probably going to discolor your candle. However, it won't be quite as severe. So some of the candles that we had in our testing that discolored to kind of some pretty and interesting colors are the Orange 10X essential oil. It kind of looks like a creamsicle, I don't know. I kind of like it, but as you can see, it's a very dark orange. That was pretty much immediate. Same thing with Tangerine, and I think even the Orange Valencia discolored a little bit. And then this one, which is the Lilac also, quite a pretty color. It's kind of a light pinkish purple, um, but that was obviously not the intended color. So if you're using dyes, you definitely wanna make sure that you're testing things as it could alter the actual shade of your finished candle, just as it has with these white candles. Sometimes over time, you'll also see discoloration Almost all fragrance and essential oils are UV light sensitive. So if you're displaying them in a store or they're close to a window in your home, you may also see some discoloration, kind of like this one here, where you can see it started out pretty off-white and normal, but over time it's just gotten a little more yellow or orange. This shouldn't affect the function of your candle. And oftentimes I like to tell people when candles are made with natural wax, it's just like getting a little candle suntan.
let's talk about scent throw. So there's two kinds of scent throw, and you probably already know this, that's okay, I'm gonna repeat it anyway. So there's cold throw, which is how the candle smells when it's not burning. So you go to the store, you take the lid off, you smell the candle, it should smell like something. That's cold throw. This is what makes you wanna buy the candle. Hot throw is what the candle smells like and the strength of that scent in the room while the candle is burning. This is what keeps people coming back after they've bought the candle. The strength of your scent throw can largely depend on the size of your container. So something like this small four ounce jar container is probably not gonna give significant scent throw past a couple of feet in diameter. So it's best to test that in a small room, like an office or a bedroom, for example, whereas the larger containers would probably give pretty decent throw in a very large room, like a living room or a kitchen. Another thing to keep in mind is that when you get into these larger container sizes, so I like to say anything above the three and a half inch mark, you're probably gonna wanna do a double wick. So two wicks of a smaller size can often give you better hot throw than one wick that's larger. So just another thing to add to your long list of things to test. The last thing that I think is a good reminder when you're testing candles is this little thing that we call scent fatigue or olfactory fatigue. This happens to me a lot and it used to happen to me even more when I started out and I was making candles in my house. I would try to burn a candle and I couldn't really tell whether or not it had good hot throw and the reason was just that my whole house smelled like candles. So there was sort of this cocktail of fragrance oils that I had gotten used to, right? When you walk into your home, you don't think about how your house smells, you just, that's how your house smells. But when someone else walks into your home, they notice that it's a different or unique smell from their home. So this is something that you wanna keep in mind when you're testing. I often will give a candle to a friend and have them test it or go over there while it's burning and see if I get a difference. Most of the time, I do. When you're working with the same scents over and over, it's totally normal that your nose is just gonna get used to those scents. So don't be afraid to, you know, ask someone to burn a candle. Most people are gonna be excited to be a volunteer for that. So last question, when should you retest? Well, if you feel really confident in your process, which doesn't change or shouldn't be changing very often, and your base test and the materials aren't changing very often, you shouldn't have to retest the same things more than once or twice a year. Keep in mind that even fragrance oils will have some sort of natural components and obviously essential oils are all natural, so those can fluctuate from batch to batch. Sometimes my recipe for a fragrance uh, changes just a little bit depending on whether one ingredient comes from a different batch or the same batch as the last time. So it's always good to retest periodically just to make sure that things are performing the way that you think they should. The other time that you wanna retest is anytime you add a new variable. Sometimes that variable is uncontrollable, like during the time of COVID or post COVID even still, when different suppliers are switching to new manufacturers, it's a good idea to make sure that those materials work the way that your old ones did. It's possible that they don't. So just for safety and consistency, test and retest when you think one of those things has changed or if you just wanna burn a free candle. All right, friends, one last recap and then I'll let you get back to the fun parts of candle making. But I just wanna review the three types of testing that we did today. So number one is your core material test, which is testing your wax, your wick, your container, no fragrance. Number two is testing all of those things with multiple sizes of wicks, depending on which wicks work best in the first one. If you can say which wicks work best three times fast, you get a prize. The third test is our fragrance test. So any fragrance that you want to use, you wanna make sure that you test that as well. Those are the three tests. After that, you can get back to making candles and doing all of the other fun business parts that I know that there are. All right, maker friends, that's a wrap. Thanks for having me back on the Brambleberry channel. If you liked our video today, go ahead and like and subscribe to the Brambleberry channel. And of course, we always wanna see your projects and your testing, so make sure you hashtag BrambleOn so we can check those out as well. We'll see you next time. Warm it up. Yep. <laughs> Don't put that in there. <laughs>
I will find out. <laughs> London out. <laughs> Sick. All right. Just 